Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and friends. I am Kui Ru Tsai, Director of International Exchanges at NUK. On behalf of National University of Kaohsiung, I'd like to welcome you all to our second lecture of the AVA Fall Series. AVA Fall Series brings in experts across disciplines to share their insights and latest research developments on the pressing issues revolving around global climate change. Today, we focus on SDG 14, Life Below Water, with an overarching theme of ocean economy and sustainable fishery. But before we start, I'd like to introduce our distinguished guest, Ding Dimson from Biko University. Uh, Ding Dimson, would you like to give us some uh, welcome remarks? Oh, okay, my pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, we are aware that there is a growing clamor all over the world right now, including the Philippines, as far as climate change is concerned, as our natural world changes around us, so does our way of life. Um, we have to be very conscious and cautious of our mindsets as well as our actions. Um, it is indeed very imperative. This is actually very timely and it is indeed very imperative for all of us really to recalibrate our efforts and then refocus our initiatives over the health of the oceans and their ecosystems. In fact, Bicol University Philippines um, is committing to one of the 17 United Nations Sustainable um, towards sustainable aquatic ecosystems. So I am very, very delighted for in behalf of our university president. Thank you very much for for letting us again for the second time around co-host the Asia Virtual Academy the 2021 Fall Series um, Lecture Series Program. Now we focus on what you've just mentioned a moment ago, um, the, the life below water, and that is climate change and global challenges. So thank you very much, and I'd like to welcome each one of you to our virtual academy. Thank you and welcome. So as I mentioned earlier, today we focus on SDG 14, Life Below Water. Today, we're honored to have Dr. Alex P. Kamaya from Biko University with us today. Dr. Kamaya received his PhD in Kuroshio Science Cell Biology from Kochi University in Japan. He has published widely in academic journals of fisheries, coral reef, and biosciences. He's leading a number of research projects and he's also actively engaged in a wide range of academic activities, including coaching fellow scientists to write research proposals and manuscripts for publication, uh, which is quite impressive. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you, to all the guests, Dr. Kamaya. The floor is yours, Dr. Kamaya. Thank you very much, Madam. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Alex Kamaya from Bicol University, Philippines. Today, I will be your lecturer for the uh, day two of this virtual uh, Asian Virtual Academy, uh, sponsored by National University of Kaohsiung. So just hearing me, please wait for a while. I'm just opening my presentation. I I guess you you see my screen now. So please inform me if you got some problem, some trouble opening there or seeing this uh video from mine. Okay, so again, good afternoon. Uh, to start my discussion, so I am 
assigned, I was given a task by this uh, Asia Virtual Academy. It's a very significant event. But to, to discuss with you the ocean economy and sustainable fishery. So this afternoon, I'll be emphasizing on the tuna fisheries and the whale shark ecotourism in the global and the local scale. Okay, so um, here is the map of the Philippines. You know, um, I, I better choose to discuss on the two, these two important fin fishes, which is a major... Um, it's a migratory and found these two fin fishes are highly migratory species and found in vast oceans of the world. So I mainly choose these two species as a as a, as a model uh, species to to discuss with you the global economy, ocean economy as well as the sustainable fishery because they are the prominent ocean commodities. They are heavily exploited worldwide and these are the key species of major economic and ecological importance. So as you can see, here in the map of the Philippines, um, the Bicol region is found here, and somewhere here in Laguni Gulf, we have here a vast uh, fisheries for tuna, as well as you can find here in Bicol region, uh, a prominent site in the country where the whale shark ecotourism has success had successfully been established. So so far in the in the in the in the country, this is uh, one one of the uh, so far the wild shark ecotourism is the the prominent uh, place where the tourism had occurred and had successfully implemented its program. I'll be discussing with you in this lecture this um, six important parts of my lecture. So this contains the learning objectives the brief introduction of the my profile as your lecturer so i'll thank you for that uh, for that I, i'll be sharing with you this one the definition of the keywords which i use in this lecture uh, the introduction this is a very short glimpse of the global ocean economy and sustainable fisheries the fifth one is the aspect of the fishery economy and sustainability in the global and the local scale with emphasis on the tuna fishery in the whale shark ecotourism as well as I, uh, the last one, I'll be sharing with you a very brief a closing statement about this topic. For this lecture, the learning objectives will uh, aims to demonstrate first is to demonstrate the understanding of the principles of the ocean economy on sustainable and sustainable fisheries in the context of the tuna and the shark management. Secondly, it aims to create knowledge and awareness on the status of the global and the regional fishery practices and management system. And finally, this lecture will introduce sound measure for the sustainable fishery resource management as being perceived for the global context. So the, here is my brief profile. So I'll just be showing this very in the, just a very short uh, presentation. So I'm your lecturer again. Alex Kamaya from the Bicol University. I am assistant professor. I used to, to teach on the BU graduate fisheries program of the university as well as the undergrad program. And also I am a part of the uh, Bicol University Tobago Campus Education Department. I am a graduate as mentioned by our uh, organizer. I was a graduate of Doctor of Philosophy in Cell Biology uh, in March 2017. I'm specializing on the cell division of the corals. Here are some of the recent publication which I, uh, which I published in the uh, reputable journals. Also, I was engaged in several international, national, and the local uh, uh, gatherings, uh, scientific meetings. Also, I uh, these are the recent uh, research projects which I am engaged which I, uh, I am um, uh, joining right now. So we have this, the national, nationally funded um, uh, project. We have also the institutionally funded project. And also, uh, I was engaged in several uh, organizing uh, events for the research-related activities in, this, in the university. Likewise, I will be defining 
what are the keywords used in this lecture. So this is very essential part of my discussion because I need to present to you uh, the, the brief definition of this. Uh, I, um, I know, I understand that uh, some of the participants here in this uh, lecture series are uh, are, a group, uh, are, are from different uh, scope of their discipline or field of study. So I need to define this for for the uh, information of the, every, every one of the participants. First, the ocean economy. This defines the sum of the economic activities of the ocean-based industries together with the assets, goods, and services provided by the marine ecosystem. Second, sustainable fisheries uh, is the level of fishing that can be maintained that depends on the productivity of the population, which is a function of growth rate, the reproduction, and natural mortality. A sustainable fishery requires a persistent and viable population in the wild. The, the third keyword which I, which I use here is tuna fishery. It is a fishing ground or place where tuna or pelagic migratory fin fish around mainly in the warm seas extensively fished in a commercial scale worldwide. The fourth word or the keyword I use is the whale shark ecotourism. This is a responsible kind traveling that conserve and protect the whale shark in its natural environment while maintaining the well-being of the local population, of the people uh, residing in that place. And the fifth one I used to define here, Bicol region Philippines. I will I emphasize this because um, this is the, the, the grassroots of my discussion here. Uh, I'll be... Uh, this is the, the main part where the Bicol region is a uh, major aspect of the global economy. So region, Bicol region is known as the Region 5 or the fifth region of the country. It comprises six provinces lying southeasterly part of the Luzon. Luzon is the biggest island of the Philippines. And this is located, Bicol region is located just adjacent to the West Pacific Ocean part. Okay, to introduce, I'll be discussing with you here a short glimpse of the global ocean economy and fisheries. Okay, so this is just a very short one. I just want to give you um, uh, uh, brief information about what is, the globe, what is the status of the global economy, what is the status of the ocean economy, as well as the fishery condition. I mainly used the website from the World Bank. You know, World Bank is a very famous banking institution that supports environmental conservation initiatives, um, uh, species management. Okay, so World Bank is a very important uh, uh, institution in the in in the whole world that used to finance a lot of environmentally or ecologically sound activities. You know. Uh, according to them, billions of people worldwide, especially the world's poorest, so they are referring to the, uh, the poorest of the poor people around the world, rely on the whole healthy oceans as a source of jobs and food, underscoring the urgent need to sustainably use, manage, and protect these natural resources. According to this uh, organization, OECD, the ocean contributes around 1.5 trillion of US dollar annually in the value added to the overall economy. The Food and Agriculture Organization estimated that around 60 million people are employed worldwide in the fishing. 39 million, 39 million uh, of the people are in the fishing and 20.5 uh, million are in the fish farming. Most in the developing countries are small scale or what we call as the artisanal fisheries and fish farmers. In 2018, the global fisheries and aquaculture amounted to approximately 179 million tons with a first scale value estimated of 401 billion US dollar, generating about 164 uh, US dollar or in billions in exports, including 60% from the developing countries. 
In 2017, they also reported that the fish have provided about 3.5 billion people with almost 20% of their average intake of the animal protein with an even higher proportion in many countries. So that's the overwhelming contribution of our ocean economy, giving us revenue, giving us a lot of uh, income as well as the food intake for the people around the world. And yet, while ocean resources boost the, uh, bo both the growth and the wealth, they are often brought to the brink of human activities. You know, fish stock managed beyond biologically sustainable levels that rose from 10% to uh, from 1974 to 34.2% in 2017, while in the same year, approximately 60% of the fish stock were fished at maximally sustainable level or the full, fully exploited uh, fishing. Globally, the fish stock are significantly affected by the illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing. Through the exact magnitude of the matter, it is difficult to as, uh, assess uh, accurately. Okay, so right now the World Bank report that there are more than 80 billion US dollar is foregone in the economic benefits are due to the overfishing and overcapacity. So in this paper by Golden et al. in 2017, they presented the percentage of the assessed fish stock that are fished at biologically unsustainable level. This is a reiteration from the report of the FAO. They tell that there is really an increase from uh, increase in the, uh, as compared in 1980s, the overfishing incidence of the overfishing uh, had raised to 30%. So this is uh, giving us the one that this is giving us the data, okay, the report that there is from 1980 to 2000. 2010, there is a, a dramatic increase in the overfishing incidents all over the world. As well as uh, another factor is the pollution. You know, the, the, the estimated annual plastic waste input from land into the ocean have dramatically increased in time. So this is also giving a threat to the vulnerable species worldwide. What the World Bank is saying us what the World Bank is telling us, we must improve the fisheries in management, invest in the sustainable aquaculture and the protection of key habitats that could help restore the productivity of the ocean and generate benefits worth of billions of dollars in developing countries. While ensuring future growth, the food security and jobs for the coastal communities. So now I'll be giving you the important point of this lecture. So. I'll be uh, first emphasizing on the tuna fisheries in the global, as well as the, and the and eventually I will be discussing on the local scale, which is in the Philippines, Bicol region and as well as in the Philippines. So why tuna? This is very essential, as I, as I said. Uh, according to this uh, website from World Wildlife Fund, I, 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 this is very amazing for me. This, that's why I use this as a, uh, as a, slide for this presentation. Tuna underpin the ecosystem and economies where they live. They are an apex predator and consume a wide variety of other fish, from squid to herring to sardines. This keeps the population of other species healthy and balanced. Tuna are also among the most commercially valuable fish on the planet and support artisanal and industrial fishing alike. They are plentiful and affordable source of protein for people around the world, driven by this demand and high prices, especially for the sushi market. Fishers using even, uh, even uh, use more refined techniques to use or to catch tuna, and some species are disappearing as a result of these uh, activities. And uh, earlier, I, I mentioned about the sushi, you know, uh, this is a very famous Japanese cuisine. Sushi uh, used to, oh, uh, sushi, uh, sushi cuisine used um, raw tuna for, uh, uh, as, a, uh, as, a, uh, as an edible, uh, 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 commercially uh, uh, 
used product in the market you know japanese are fond of um a fan of making this sushi as their uh, traditional cuisine okay and this uh sushi is mainly mainly uh, uh used uh, tuna products from from the tuna product i mean also uh here is the image of a canned goods this is very uh, prominent or very uh, common in the philippines so this is a canned goods made up of uh, tuna uh, it's a i i am fond of eating this one also and also uh here i'm showing you here um this is the uh in a restaurant you can find a lot of tuna sandwiches and you can uh there uh, these tuna sandwiches are found all over the world you know this is very common um, um source of snack for uh, poor people around the world and also other products here are yeah we have a lot of products that are made from tuna so the question is are tuna threatened yes of course there are three important uh, aspects of threatening tuna species overfishing illegal fishing and bycatch overfishing in the sense that tuna specifically the bluefin tuna are heavily overfished as well as the atlantic big eye as well as the indian ocean bluefin tuna a yellowfin tuna they are experiencing experiencing overfishing because of the increased catch level in the recent years. The skip jackweed is the most highly um, high demand or highly exploited species among tuna could easily slip into the vulnerable state due to the overfishing if properly managed. Second one, illegal fishing. Uh, Atlantic bluefin tuna is a big problem and a fishery has been plagued by the lack of enforcement. Tuna ranching pens that are used to temporarily house and fatten wild fish can serve as a means of laundering illegal fishing. This is one means of, although uh, uh, tuna are highly migratory, but fish pens okay, that used to do a ranching pens for the tuna are illegal in, in the uh, in the in the policy okay in the international law of the sea okay and the third one is the bycatch since juvenile yellow fin and the big eye tuna schools with adult skipjack they are increasingly caught by bycatch or this is actually uh, associated catch this is not intentionally being catch okay so the word bycatch is just um, associated with um, with not intention catching of the fish or unintended capture by vessel that is targeted as skipjack. The removal of this juvenile yellowfin tuna before they have a chance to spawn could lead to the fewer yellowfin in the long term. Almost most yellowfin tuna in the big eye tuna stocks are abundant throughout the range. They can be in danger because of overfishing, because of this bycatch. If management does not adequately take this bycatch into the account. Another important website that I uh, fostered here is the from the Pew Charitable Trust. You know, this is an NGO that existed uh, almost a century. So they they uh, they used to uh, show this very important uh, recent. Uh, global contribution of the tuna fishing they said that the commercial tuna fishing have contributed more than 40 billion us dollar annually to the global economy despite the study that the catch had increased that increases its value had declined also this website provide us a very informative data about top 10 tuna fishing nation in the world you can you can uh, show here you can see here among the top 10 indonesia is the most or the most productive in terms of tuna fishing and uh, secondly we have the japan papua new guinea that taiwan also spain ecuador korea united nation united states sorry kiribati as well as the philippines you can show that Indonesia, you can show here that Indonesia and the Philippines are just a neighboring country. But uh, uh, Philippines and Indonesia are 
are of different uh, are of uh, are of uh, big uh, discrepancy in ca- in in terms of the use of the fishing gears. Indonesians have used a lot or of uh, various types of the fishing gear in in catching tuna. Compared with the Philippines, Philippines is hardly um, mainly using person as well as the hand line, which is more sustainable in approach. And generally, in the whole world, the widely used fishing gear is the person. So this is the most, especially in Ecuador. So almost, uh, it's already, it's 100%, sorry, it's 100% that the Ecuadorian people use this uh, person to catch the uh, tuna tuna uh, species. In Table 1, this shows that the total value of the seven most commercially important tuna species. So from 2012 to 2018, so the catch, the global catch of tuna in metric tons, million of metric tons is from 4.6 to 5.2. So this is dramatic increase. This is, there is the dramatic increase in the catch of the tuna in metric tons. Okay. So in that value, in the billion of US dollar, so there's also a little a little increase in it because what uh, what the few charitable trust websites saying despite of the increasing number of the catch okay there is that um, also dramatic or significant decrease in its value okay the end value here is uh, in billion pesos okay it's from 41.6 to 40.8 billion pesos a billion billion US dollar sorry this website also pro- uh, gave us these values that vary by species in volume with less than a third of the total landing yellowfin duck value roughly equal skip, skip jacks while the bluefin species were the most valuable metric per, uh, per tons here you can see that in 2018 Skipjack tuna is highly commercialized or highly caught all over the world. This is seconded by the yellowfin, which has, has 1.5 million or 20.8% of the catch. The, the foremost is 2.9 million or almost 50% or more than the 50% of the tuna landings are being uh, represented by skipjack tuna. In terms of the duck value by species in US dollar, yellowfin, uh, yellowfin tuna worth 4.8 billion US dollar, or it represents 37.44 uh, US dollar, billion US dollar, or 37.4% of the, uh, the value in terms of the duck, duck value by species. So it is, it is uh, seconded by skipjack, which has a 4.0 billion or 34.4%. 0.5% in value. And as well as in the end value of the species, okay, these two most prominent species also got the higher share. Uh, this uh, skipjack shared 39.52%, giving off 61, uh, 16.1 billion uh, US dollar as end value. And for this uh, yellowfin, it shares 38.66% or 15.8 billion US dollar. In terms of the areas or the oceans in the world, world, uh, world oceans, the, the Pacific Ocean is the world's largest and the most valuable tuna fisheries. It claims for 66% or 3.4 million in metric tons of tuna. Okay, so this is already the total. Uh, tuna catch. It is seconded by Indian Ocean as well as the Atlantic Ocean. In terms of that value, uh, so also the Pacific Ocean gives up 61% or 7.1 billion US dollar. And in terms of the end value of the ocean, okay, Pacific Ocean is 64% or 26.2 billion US dollar. Okay, in the Philippines, you know. Uh, Tuna fisheries is a very significant, a very important commercial fin fishes. It has been a long major tuna producer in the Western and Central Pacific Ocean or WCTO. 
both for the domestic food security and on industrial scale. With a productive exclusive economic zone of 2.2 million square kilometers in extent and a population approaching 80 million or more than that this time, Philippines, Philippines tuna fisheries initially developed to supply local demand. The tuna have continued to contribute over 20% of the marine fisheries production in the most years. And the domestic catch of the oceanic species has been over 150,000 tons in most years since the early 1990s. As local catch rates have declined, tuna fisheries have expanded since the mid-1980s to operate increasingly in the adjacent, adjacent areas of the western and the central Pacific Ocean notably the Indonesia, the Papua New Guinea, and the high seas areas. To skip that, domestic tuna fisheries are concentrated on the south region. The southern region in, um, consisted of the General Santos City in the Philippines. Okay? So where a variety of the gears are used to catch the both oceanic, like the skipjack tuna, the bluefin, and the big eye, as well as the neretic tuna or the frigate, and bullet tuna or the little tunas. These are often associated with other small pelagic species. Overseas operations involves large percent vessels. So as, as, as reflected in the data, the global data for the use of the fishing gear, similarly, Philippines has, have been using percent as a very prominent uh, fishing gear in catching a uh, commercial uh, scale of tuna. But it's also wide-ranging handline vessels like the pump boats or the banka. Actually, in the Bicol region, especially in Albay, here in our place, handline is the most prominent way of catching big tunas. And the distant water, water, long lines fleet are all targeting ocean tunas, which are for the most part landed in the Philippine ports. This is the recent data from the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources of the Philippines. And this data showing us the, uh, the commercial fisheries production by fish species by, in 2018. Okay, so here, skip that tuna is the most highly produced tuna species in the country, giving off 230, almost 230 metric tons or 24.2% of the total catch, okay? Second, we have the yellowfin tuna. Yellowfin tuna contributed about 60,000 60, metric tons or giving up 6.3% of the major catch production in the commercial scale. The third one is the frigate tuna and giving off just the, near, near to the yellowfin tuna is almost 6.1 or 6.1 percent to the uh, major fish contribution of fisheries production. And and the, on the 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 another tuna, which is the ninth in the ranking, is the eastern little tuna or the bonito, giving off 21,362.01 metric tons or 2.3 percent of the total uh, commercial fisheries production in the Philippines. So. In this data, this shows that in the commercial scale, four of the important uh, tuna, uh, tuna species in the world are also being highly commercialized or highly produced in the Philippines. I referred to this one paper by Makuse et al. In, uh, published in uh, Marine Policy. So they reported, or they reiterated in their report, the estimated total catch of the three important uh, tuna species in the Philippines. As you can see here, this is relative or this is uh, in congruence to the, to the report of the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic uh, Resources of the Philippines that the skipjack is the most uh, highly, highly commercialized or highly catched tuna species in the Philippines. It is seconded by the yellowfin, and the third one is the uh, big eye tuna. Also, this report have tell us that uh, using the persane, 
By the way, this report is based on the interview in the most prominent uh, place of tuna fisheries in the Philippines, which is in the General Santo City. It is in the, uh, in the southern area of the Philippines. According to their study, the, the common species found okay, in, the, in, in, that, in, their, in, that, in that place, having these uh, sizes and the weight are this, this data. It shows that the most or the biggest, uh, the commonly or the common biggest uh, tuna species is the sailfish or the this one, which has a 100, uh, sorry, swordfish, sorry, which has a 185 in centimeter, its length weighing about 74 kilograms. So this is the common according to them. Okay, yellowfin is among the also the biggest one, which has a 139 centimeter in length, giving off 47 kilograms in weight. Okay, and one of the smallest one is the uh, rainbow runner, which is 23. Okay, so this uh, this data is showing about the, uh, the 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 different species of the caught in the first thing. So not just in the not just in for the tuna, but in in general. So but here is is giving us that information that. The, the skipjack tuna, the yellowfin tuna, okay, as well as the, the big eye tuna are one of the important or the important species found, which is the commonly, uh, which has the size which is commonly caught in the General Santo City. So skipjack could uh, range from the smallest one from 27 centimeter, the yellowfin from 30, but the yellowfin also gives us 139 in centimeter or 47 kilograms. While the big fish, our big eye tuna could give us 152 centimeter or giving off 50 kilograms. While the uh, skipjack could give us or the, the skipjack the skipjack tuna used to uh, used to grow. The the caught skipjack tuna can uh, used to grow at the 66 centimeter or giving off six kilograms in weight. Okay. So this is the mean number of catch and distance per person in the ring net and handline fishers from the six different parts, okay, in the in their study. So from uh, in 1990s, it shows that the catch of 16 tons have had been had just been caught very near to the shore. The distance is only just 100 kilometers from the shore, and by the year 2000. So the distance from the person or the ring net uh, fi uh, fishing gear used to extend up to 17 or 17. Uh, the catch is 17 tons, but you can fish this 17 tons in 417 kilometers. It's a little bit far. It's very far from the, from, the, from the coastal area. And now, giving off only 17 tons and the, the fishers used to fish in as far as 446 kilometer from the from the uh, coastal area similarly in handline okay although the the catch in pounds are not so very uh, not so not not differ so much but the distance used to increase okay it means that the area or the fishing ground for tuna are getting deeper and deeper and farther and farther from the coastal areas this is probably one of the mechanism of the tuna to to avoid overfishing from human you know this data or this from this paper it shows that the municipal and commercial have a big discrepancy in terms of the catch from 19 uh, from early 1900s to year uh, 2000 okay so it tells that the uh, municipal has bigger tuna catch and other pelagic fishes in the Philippines rather than the uh, commercial fisheries. Here also I'll be showing with you the condition of the tuna fisheries in the Bicol region, specifically in the Bicol region. This report tells about the assessment of the fishery resources in Laguna Igor, where I shown to you the place earlier. Okay, so here they gave us uh, four important tuna species out of the 15, 
sorry, 12 fin species or 12 species of fin fishes in Laguna Golf. The 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 amount or the value or the the volume of sorry the volume of the tuna uh, tuna species found in Laguna Golf are enormous. Katsunoe spinamis giving off the catch of 200 uh, 2547 metric tons in the year um sorry for this in the in the in the recent year from nine from 1990 to 2012. Second is the Tunus albacares, is giving off 1,950 or almost 2,000 meter tons in catch. In catch, we have also Tunus alalunga, giving off 428 meter tons of catch in Laguna Golf. And finally, the Oxus tassard, giving us 172 meter tons of catch. So, essentially, inside the Laguna Golf, we can find this four important tuna uh, products or tuna species just only in Laguna Golf, okay? This is a small area fishing ground in the Bicol region where uh, tuna are highly commercialized. So how do tuna are caught and commercialized in the Philippines? This is just a very, uh, uh, very short uh, description of this process. Mainly in the Philippines, like the the person person vessels okay they use this kind of floater okay they have this weight and they have this pump fronts that used to uh for the school of tuna to to aggregate so we call it the fish aggregating device or fad okay they use this kind of model for fish aggregating device and out of that so what the fishing vessels are using First, they used to uh, to deploy the fad or the fishing fish aggregating fish aggregating device in the target area in the in the in the commercial uh, commercial uh, uh, water in the Philippines. Then, for some some few months, they used to monitor the fad whether there is already the school of tuna. Second, they used to uh, uh, to do the night lighting just to monitor if the uh, school of fish have already uh, been there okay and then there will be some fad setting net hauling okay they used to catch already this is the process where the catching of tuna is already being done and then they have the catch uh, brailing and the brailing after they catch tuna they on the uh, per same boat okay and then they transfer the frozen catch into the service boat which is smaller than the the first thing and finally the server the service boat used to enroll or they used to uh, to to transport the, the the tuna catch into the port or to into the cannery. Okay, this is already in for the commercial uh, for commercial purposes. The Philippines, in terms of tuna trade, has been doing the international uh, trading. Uh, since the export of about 30 to 40 percent of the tuna production, tuna is exported either in the fresh or in chilled or in the frozen or canned system. In 2001, the total export of the fish and the fisheries products was valued of 20, 20, 22.7 billion pesos. Of this, the tuna and the tuna products accounted for about 27 percent or 5.87 billion in pesos. So this is the statistics way back in 2001. This export data, however, may not be very accurately since spot buying or in fishing ground by the foreign companies is very common. Japan, US, Thailand, and Taiwan are the major market destinations of the fresh as well as the chilled and frozen tuna products from the Philippines. The canned tuna production grew considerably in 1980s in the early 1990s, up to 22% of the canned tuna export are sent to U.S. and 17% to Germany, 15% to Canada, and the rest in other 21 countries in Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Asia. So as of now, what is the status of the, uh, of the fisheries production of tuna in the Philippines? According to the FAO, okay, the fishing industry contributes estimated 1.8 billion, oh, sorry, 1.8% or amounting to 
196 billion pesos to the country's gross domestic gross domestic product or GDP at the current prices, respectively in 2012. In 2013, export of fish and fisher product are valued at 1.2 US dollar billion, billion US dollar. Tuna was the top export commodity of the Philippines. It was followed by the shrimp and prawns. In the same year, ex imports were, were worth of 264 million US dollar. What are the measures for sustainable tuna fisheries in the Philippines? So I got this from the um, from the National Tuna Management Plan of the Philippines, created by the Department of Agriculture, Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. So I'll not I'll, I'll not be tackling this more, but there are three important three important uh, uh, measures, okay, that the that that National Tuna Management of the Philippines are being implemented. First is the sustainable management of the tuna fisheries within the Philippine jurisdiction. Second is the effective jurisdiction and control over the Philippine flag vessel fishing beyond areas of national jurisdiction. And the third one is the responsible trade of the, the tuna product. So these are the different uh, subsection of these three important management uh, options uh, provided by the National Tuna Management of Plan of the Philippines. Okay. So I also give emphasis on this website of the WWF, which is one of the NGO working on the tuna management and conservation all over the world. What the WWF now is doing is the they have to uh, they are working now on the fishery improvement projects for the tuna fisheries. They also build on the business case. Okay, the tuna industry continues to explore business cases for the improving practices in the tuna management. Okay, and also they aim or they are working now on the leveraging the global market okay they know that tuna is the very important or essential commodity in the in the uh, ocean global economy and this organization used to work on the tuna processes traders they used to collaborate with the, the with, with the traders and marketers all over the world having uh, having a partnership okay uh to to use of uh, they to empower the private sector to catalyze improvement in the fishing practices, management, and conservation. It also provides financial support to the incentive of the fishers looking to commit for the long-term sustainability. And now, giving for the mes uh, perceived measure for the sustainable fisheries of tuna and associated species, so uh, this website is giving us three important measures on how to sustainably fish tuna and other associated species or other pelagic species. First is to modernize the management through the harvest strategies. Okay. Second, improve the oversight and accurate reporting of the fishing activities. And lastly, ensure the consequences of non-compliance with the fisheries rules. Without these measures, there could be a significant negative consequences for the industries, communities, and ecosystems that depend on tunas. This action would improve the global fisheries governance and secure strong financial returns in the international fisheries while ensuring the health of the marine environment. Now, we will be dealing on the second aspect, which is the whale shark ecotourism. Okay, as I said, uh, I'll be also be emphasizing on the global and the local scale for this uh, venture, local uh, whale shark ecotourism. Uh, ventures. According to this paper telling about the global economic value of the shark ecotourism, all over the world there are about 70 war or shark watching sites in the four and in 45 countries worldwide. So this report is uh, this report is in 2013. They tell us that shark ecotourism have generated 341 million US dollar in terms of tourism, okay? In terms of tourism revenue globally. Shark ecotourism also includes, or it gives us increasing number of watchers. In 2013, there are, there are recorded of 590,000 90, watchers, or this simply gives us that this number of uh, tourists are increasing or in they're increasing their 
demand or uh, interest in in this kind of in this kind of venture also this uh, this uh, ecotourism uh, venture have supported around 10,000 jobs among the villagers worldwide this data is showing us the different countries or different location in the in the world with available data on the annual shark watching expenditures okay so uh, the blue one shows that uh, bahamas a, a widely known uh, tourism or uh, a widely known uh, tourist spot destination in the whole world giving us the work a shark watching expense expenditure of 82269 so this is the value in in uh, in terms of the uh, in the number of the watchers and this shark landed value is just very short or this very uh is it's very few it's all just 0 0.1 it means that bahamas this country are not at, uh, are not using economically or for the commercial purposes the the shark or for food it means that they mainly give shark for ecotourism or for the for the tourism purposes only philippines is one of the countries listed here where where shark watching expenditures have been recorded it's uh it's giving of 226 okay in terms of this uh but but uh in contrast philippines also are yeah are highly uh, is one of the country that highly uh, utilizing or commercializing commercializing shark species okay so it's give in the record we have here 5647 okay these values are per year in the us dollar at 1000 or at 2011 rate okay so it is very uh it is uh it, this data shell is giving us uh, information that still um philippines is one of the country which exploits shark okay at present time even at present time okay so observe on this data it is the projected uh total number of the shark watchers at the site and with the trend information especially in Dunsol, philippines and the, in other different places in the world okay so it tells us that the uh, shark watchers relative to the content okay it tells us from 1990 beginning in the year 2000 up to the uh, projected uh, uh, projected number of 2030 this uh, this significantly gives us that uh, there are many or there are more and more people are engaging or used to expand their money for whale watching as a source of recreation or for the uh, in support of the ecotourism this is estimated more than double in the next 20 years, giving us 700 million US dollars. Also, the data gives us that despite of the increasing number of shark sanctuaries and ecotourism, the shark fisheries remains high in the past decades, where the landed value of the global shark fisheries is amounting to 630 million US dollars, especially in 2013. Okay? So in the local scale, we have this whale shark ecotourism in Dunsol. It's found in Sorsogon. Uh, it's the southern part of the Bicol region okay, in the Philippines. So here are some of the photos I got from the internet showing how the people loves whale shark or locally known as Butanding in the Philippines. I'll be giving you some, uh, this, this, this is the, just a brief history of how the whale shark ecotourism have bloomed or have begun in the in Dunsol, Philippines. This, uh, you know, uh, Dunsol, Philippines is located 500 kilometers southeast of the capital of Manila. And through the ages, the whale shark have gathered up and feed eight months every year in the nutrients of in the nutrient rich water of Dunsol River estuaries. It is the world's largest fish, you know, that you know, that this whale shark. And it's, it's can, it can weigh as much as 125 tons and reach about 
over 21 meters. Whale shark can be found in the tropical and the warm temperate seas in a high migratory. Uh, these are high migratory uh, species. Okay, in 1998, the plankton bloom have attracted the whale shark in an unusual number in Dunsol, and this was reported actually that in the same year, the 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 provincial tourism or the Social and Provincial Tourism Council show or saw the potential of the Donsol place as an ecotourism site in the country. Because of this, there is already the promotion in the media, okay, eventually followed attracting the tourists as well as the hunters in big numbers to the small and insufficiently equipped society of Donsol. According to this uh, report from uh, I got. Okay, this is uh, presented in the first International Whale Shark Conference, Challenges and Lessons Learned in Setting Up the Community-Based Whale Shark Ecotourism Program, the case in Dunsol, Philippines, uh, reported by Tine et al. How does ecotourism in, the, in Dunsol had occurred or had, it, had been established? The whale shark are being... Uh, before, the whales are, are being heavily hunted for their meat, for their fins. So this was heavily butchered, in short, especially in the different places of the Philippines. Okay? In the study conducted by, uh, by this group, you know, um, it says that in the central Visayas, uh, northern Mindanao, there are five sites where identified which, which traditionally fished the whale shark. And an alarming number of 31 more fishing ground in the Philippines were also reported with the existence of this, uh, with this uh, exploitation of this uh, whale shark. Okay, so unlike with the in the case of Dunsol, this is not happening. So what what the the group of uh, World Wildlife Fund, you know, this is a uh, uh, this is uh, one of the organizations that helps in, in managing and conserving the whale shark in the world. So they used to visit place, the Dunsol, for the presence of the whale shark and to identify the appropriate action for conservation. Okay, So this gives, us the, this gives them the opportunity for setting up a community-based community whale shark ecotourism venture. They felt that the influx of the media because of the concurrent media attention, as well as the influx of the tourists. So at this stage, the community had no experience in tourism and the manner in which the whale shark tourists were operated and managed. This became a big challenge for them. Okay? So this group, uh, no, uh, uh, the, and in this community, there were no skilled, according to them, there were no skilled tourism service provider that could give knowledge and understanding of the whale shark management or whale shark ecotourism for conservation purposes okay so um, what they did is they 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 make some studies they make some survey they make some uh education campaign as well as socioeconomic uh socioeconomic survey to know the to know the the awareness of the people in Dunsol in the ecotourism uh, ecotourism venture or ecotourism activities. Okay, the result shows that 80% of the respondents observed that the whale shark were present in the municipal waters. 88% of the respondents or the people that they used to survey were present between the months. They tell that the whale shark used to occur in the Dunsol water from in September as well as in July. Okay, with 86% of the respondents observing whale shark. That uh, that shark duly ob uh, observed during this period. Okay. Because of this, stakeholders, especially the residents, have an overwhelming willingness to demonstrate the to participate in the whale shark ecotourism program. So the local tourism council, along with LGU and this organization, okay, perceived to establish the whale shark ecotourism ecotourism eventually in the place. Okay. So this is the most important part here. So this is now the summary of the tourist arrival as well as the local revenue in Dunsol. Okay? Uh, 
from 1998 to year, 2000, uh, year 2004, the number of visitors have dramatically increased within the Philippines or the local tourists as well as the international tourists. Okay? The boat trips also increase. And in terms of the revenue, you can see here from the year 2002 where the ecotourism project have been implemented, it, 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 it dramatically increased to 48,316 okay, in total. I mean, sorry, in 2004, in exchange rate of 52 pesos US dollar, okay, the LGU had obtained 10,692 times 53, actually, in the US dollar in the year 2004. And also the direct providers, okay, giving giving them thirty seven thousand six hundred twenty three thousand times, uh, sorry, that's um, that's sorry, all all of this what I'm saying is in fifty four thousand a uh, fifty four pesos. That's the that's the that's the exchange rate of the Philippine peso against the U.S. dollar. Okay, so uh, this amount. Are overwhelming and you can see the dramatic increase in their revenues from 2002 where the first uh, whale shark ecotourism was established in the site and and as of now this continuing the there are uh there are some reports that tells that the that the uh, whale shark have continually giving off uh give giving of increasing revenue for the local uh, community of Dunsol. What are the perceived measures for the sustainability of the whale shark conservation as well as the protection? The paper of Pine et al. is telling that it is recognized that attention to the social and decision-making processes is very crucial in the community-based ventures such as the ecotourism. Okay, so this is very important that the that the community Okay, and the organizer as well as the local executive should have a co-management for this process, for this activity. Good governance, leadership, open communication channels, and cooperation should be further fostered among local residents to strengthen their sustainable self-management and to allow genuine community participation. A long-term financing mechanism is necessary to direct funds to conservation works to sustain the resource base for ecotourism. Okay, so this is there. There is a this, there. There is a, a a big need for the fund for this uh, type of venture to realize. We uh, the government as well as the uh, the the uh, the, uh, the, the non-government organization used to spend. A lot of money for uh, for this venture to to work. So because of this, in return they they're giving uh, they're giving them the venture. So this is one of the the, the most successful uh, type of the ecotourism, which is reported for whale shark in the Philippines. You no, know, the Dunsol, in the case of Dunsol Sorsogon. For the closing statement, so probably uh, I already uh, exceeded with my uh, one hour discussion. I don't know, so probably. So I just giving up this closing statement. According to uh, to the former, this is a former uh, foreign minister of Germany, okay, Sigmar Gabriel. Uh, I was uh, yeah fascinated by his uh, quote. Without sound conservation and management measures. Fisheries will quickly become depleted, and a basic component of the global food security will be lost. So, it is very important that sound, ecologically sound conservation and management measures, okay, should be implemented. We have a very critical situation of the marine and ocean production right now. Almost all of the species are dwindling. Many are in the uh, in the threatened or very uh, very minimal uh, amount. So the report is saying that you know there are a lot of species in the 
in the marine ecosystem that used to decline, used to vanish, okay, because of the different factors affecting them. We have the global warming. We have the climate change. We have a lot of human perturbations. We had a lot of human activities that used to give stress to these uh, very essential uh, sources of the, uh, resources in the world. So we must do something. Uh, for this lecture, I am appealing to everyone, students, my fellow uh, teachers or fellow professors in the university, to the young scientists and young researchers of the world, I am appealing to you. We should work as one. We should do something for the sustainable fisheries. We can do it in our own little way. In my case, I used to, I used to, I used to give this lot of information to my young students. Okay, I used to provide. I used to, to, to publish several papers. To give or to, to share or to contribute scientific information, to, to give a very important uh, 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 findings to the world that, you know, uh, fishery resources are in a very alarming situation. So with this, I would like to thank especially the National University of Kaohsiung for the organizing the, uh, sorry, uh, Asia Virtual Academy or AVA 2021. Sorry for this. There's a, some mistake. The Bicol University, especially Dr. Dimson Rivero, for tapping me as a speaker or as a, you know as a representative of the Bicol University, as well as the participants from the different places, from the different countries. You know, uh, I am very happy for their willingness to learn to this presentation. Again. Thank you so much and have a nice day ahead. Uh, thank you very much for uh, Dr. Kamaya for giving us a very thorough explanation on tuna fisheries and whale shark ecotourism, especially the problems and some possible actions against the problems. So. I guess uh, we'll take a five minute break. I, I'm sure Dr. Kam Kamaya can use a water break for five minutes. And meanwhile, we'll Thank take questions. Much. So please leave your questions in the YouTube chat and we'll come back in five minutes to take questions.
Hello, welcome back. Uh, Dr. Kayama, are you ready to take questions? Oh, please Sorry? unmute your. I was muted. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was muted. Okay. So I'm reading now uh, the comments the participants. I have, this is so overwhelming on them. I used to, uh, I saw most of them are, um, yeah, they're recognizing themselves. They used to introduce themselves. So far, I'm looking for some questions here. So still reading that this time. Okay, so which one would you like to take first? Yes, I, I haven't seen question yet this time. <laughs> Most of them are mainly uh, introducing themselves. Okay, so we have one question from uh, Lazil. Food insecurity is an issue that might give rise to more IUU fishing due to increased demand. What are the perceived measures to prevent the abuse of ocean resources brought about by this issue? Food insecurity is an issue that might give rise to more. Uh, this is the uh, illegal, okay, the fishing activities due to the increased demand. Yes. So um, the, the, there are several, as I presented earlier, there are several perceived measures, okay, that uh, that could help in preventing or in yeah preventing the too much decline in the food security or too much decline in the production from the uh, from the marine ecosystem. So, uh, giving is on the tuna as well as the shark production. So, uh, as again, so there are very important um, um, there are very important perceived measures. I used to set earlier, but now I'll be giving of some of the other perceived measures that. Are very important for the for the uh, for sustaining the food for sustaining food production or sustaining uh, food security for all the people. Okay, first one, people you should uh, you know every country in the world. We we should avoid too much extraction from the wild. You know the natural stocks are depleting. There are a lot of stressors that gives us you know. Uh, uh, give gives pressure to the natural resources in the marine ecosystem. So, uh, one of the important measure is yeah, uh, in investing in aquaculture. You know, uh, aqua aquaculture is very essential in in sustaining the food security. Um, giving a uh, more capability or more giving uh, giving. Um, emphasis on or giving venture on aquaculture for different different uh, uh, commercially important species are very essential. In the case of tuna, uh, there are very limited number of countries used to do the aquaculture system. Since tuna and shark are highly migratory, okay, so they are uh, faster, you know, and this is really very difficult for the human to 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 respond like aquaculture system or inland aquaculture system. So, uh, so we should uh, we should develop like uh, one of the measures is the having a good management system of the tuna fisheries. We should monitor. We should monitor the every nation should monitor the. The bycatch, okay, should monitor the overfishing, uh, overfishing uh, issues, okay. Should there should be some limit, okay, in the in the production, in the catching of this very important uh, uh, commercial of important marine resources. What I'm saying is the limit is just to have some uh, break for the tuna production or tuna fisheries. We should also give them some uh, some day like that and holiday for the for this, so that we could also give them some uh, some time to recover. So we are calling for every uh, you know very uh, every nation that used to 
highly a uh, highly uh, commercialized tuna that that we should uh, we should have the management a better a sound management okay management in the sense that uh, we could use more sophisticated stem okay uh, stem from different countries that that would help in uh, in managing or or conserving uh, tuna as well as the shark resources in the ocean so uh, there are many options actually there are many options in 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 securing the uh, in securing the food for the people okay there are many options for securing the uh, the sustainable uh, resources okay so in the ocean so very very essential that we should look into the we should hear from the from the top experts all over the world what are the very important or what is the necessary or the very uh, what is the major important uh, what is the important uh, 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 measures to be used because it used to vary from different countries or from one place to another so we should give uh, we should listen or we should hear from the experts what what they are saying about this is the different countries. So it is very essential that uh, local experts or the local uh, the local uh, scientists should should share this information to to every uh, to every community. You know that uh, that the the situation all over the world, the resources, okay, the marine resources are declining. Each one of the resources are declining. At a very alarming rate, okay, and also as well as uh, the 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 local executives, okay, as well as the national executives should work hand in hand to do this management of the resources, okay. So we can use this, we can do this if we have this co-management, if we if we have this, um, if we have this, um, uh. This is the perfect word for this co-management among the leaders of the countries, essentially to those that used to utilize very uh, high commercial uh, stocks or high commercial species from the ocean. Thank you for that. Thank you indeed. I think uh, it's such an important issue that requires joint effort from all stakeholders, from uh, public, private sectors, as well as communities at large. So, yes. Okay, uh, let's move on to our next question. Could you please yeah, I'm look the next for another question? question? Yes, I'm looking for the next question. Yes, okay. can you help There's me? There's a question that? from Grish. In what ways can the public I, yes. help minimize the threats in, impacting our fishery resources? Also, how is the whale shark ecotourism industry going now that we have travel restrictions due to a pandemic? Yes, that's a timely question. Yes, this is a, yes, this is a very good question from uh, Mr. Aviles. I, I will reiterate again. So in what ways can the public help minimize the threats impacting our fishery resources? Also, how is the whale shark ecotourism industry going now that we have a travel restriction to the pandemic? So the first one for the first question uh, for Mr. Riz Adiles. Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, you know, public is a very important uh, sector that helps in um in managing the fishery resources as consumer yes uh we can help the uh we can help minimize the impact on on the fishery uh fishery extraction okay as a, as a consumer um one of the uh, i guess what, what for me one of the best uh way for for us to help my minimize the threat is um uh, not to patronize uh, the product, which are actually um, essentially like in the shark or the shark, or I, I'm giving emphasis on the shark products. So not to patronize the product from the shark because you know it is a highly 
yeah, very vulnerable species in the in the ocean. Sharks are very essential uh, predator and top predator of the food chain. Okay, so sharks are very essential. Uh, significant loss in the number or population of the shark community in the ocean will have um, imbalance in the ecosystem. So we should we should not promote the the or patronizing the product which are being or to minimize this we should not uh, uh, help or uh, yes uh, patronize the product made from this uh, species especially the sharks also um, in in terms of in terms of uh, ecotourism uh, yes it's really very uh, essential that the pandemic uh, had reduced the number of the of the ecotourism it's really a big problem now for the local industry in Dunsol that the whale shark ecotourism used to, to used to decline at this moment in time probably this is the one best way for the for the you know the one best way for the for the area to yeah to change or like to to shift in their venture or in their businesses there are some reports that uh, that some uh, how do you call it that? recreational uh, establishment diving sites in Dunsol used to close temporarily at this time because of the uh, lack of tourists. Okay, so yes, this is really affecting. In in in, in your question, this is really uh, uh, there's no we we cannot really do anything about the how the ecotourism will work in the time of pandemic. Yes, there is no re really no tourist this time. And this probably one best way that the pandemic helped us in realizing the importance of giving a holiday to every every activity. Every human, uh, uh, how do you call that? <laughs> human activities this time. Pandemic give us the, the time for... <laughs> For, for, or it, it, yes, what I am saying for in my students are this, this is the holiday for not uh, not uh, doing anything against the environment or do, to re, to reduce the impact for the environment. Actually, there are lots of reports about the 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 pandemic have resulted eventually in a better uh, type of air quality among the. Yes, uh, more uh, more industrialized countries. So probably this is the sign of that the the pandemic um, also affecting the tourism as well as the production of these uh, important commercial species. Okay, thank you. I do hope that my that my uh, my answer could help you in your question. Thank you very much for that wonderful question. So I totally agree. I think, uh, as you said, even though there's nothing we can do uh, during the time of pandemic, but maybe it's a good opportunity for us to uh, reshape or rethinking about this uh, kind of ecotourism. So yes, yes. Um, I would like to ask uh, Ding Dingson, are there any um, are there any thoughts Hello. you would like to share with us? Yeah, actually, I'd like also to give comment on the ecotourism. Um, because of the the, the COVID nineteen pandemic, it's some sort of a breather for this uh, marine life that they're not even disturbed. So it's one way or another, like yeah. um, trying to um, um, rethink our efforts in conserving and sustainably use marine resources as well. So it's it's also, I, I would like to agree with Dr. Alex Kamaya that during the time of the pandemic, um, we were able to lessen the, you know, um, we reduce air pollution, water pollution, and these are great opportunities actually for, for marine resources and life below water also to, to take a break from human over, yes. <laughs> exactly exactly so it's a breather for them but then apparently 
um, economics wise, um, the, the, the ecotourism economy is affected, adversely affected. In fact, um, this is, this is there are number, there are even thousands of industries in the ecotourism are in distress right now. That's basically because of the global yes. health crisis. But still, um, we are on its way. Uh, we are actually on like on, on the road to recovery. Like um, there are actually some questions about the potential um, development of the fisheries and the marine fishing industry in Vietnam and other parts of the ASEAN region. As far as recovery is concerned, yes, we are actually on uh, on the road to recovery right now. And um, of course, our mac our micro efforts can can actually have um, macro effect in the long run. And that I'd like to agree also with. Um, with Dr. Kamaya that it is actually a collaborative effort. It should be a concerted effort of all the stakeholders, um, apparently, um, not just the government, it's not just the, 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 the industry itself, but also the people. Um, the, we are all part of this um, undertaking. Um, as what I have just said, we have to recalibrate our mindset and we have to refocus our, you know, um, our thoughts on this so we can have, you know, um, a sustainable um, marine life in the end. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, really thank you very much for thinking us. of your wonderful yeah. and concluding remarks. And I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Kamaya for your wonderful speech, which has given us some food for thought. So with that, um, thank you all for participating in today's event. And we look forward to seeing you in the next week's event, which is brought to you by Nonglam University, Dr. Yun Kim Loy. In, uh, the speech is entitled Climate Change and Water Resource Management. So thank you for joining us today and looking forward to seeing you all next week.